Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is a presentation of the Northeast Wind Resource Center, also known as the NWRC, and our topic for this webinar is the case for building a U.S. offshore wind vessel and other opportunities for the U.S. oil and gas sector in offshore wind. We have two excellent guest speakers with us today, and we're also joined by our host for this webinar, Val Story. Val is a project director at the Clean Energy Group, which is one of the organizations that manages the NWRC. Before I pass it over to our speakers for this webinar, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. If you see on your screen, there's a little uh, picture of what your webinar console looks like. The orange arrow that's circled in the corner there, that allows you to expand your um, expand or minimize your webinar console if you'd like to view the slides full screen. The audio box uh, should be pretty self-explanatory, but I'll go over the basics here. Um, everyone is on mic and speakers as default. You can select telephone if you'd like to join the audio portion via telephone. Um, if you select that option on your console, it will give you call-in information that you can follow. And everyone is on mute for this presentation except for our panelists. Uh, another very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions and comments as they come in, and we are saving about 15-20 minutes at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience. So please type your questions in when you think of them. Don't wait until the very end to submit your question. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you a copy of the webinar slides and recording probably this afternoon or at least within 48 hours so that you can uh, re-watch them. We also post all of our webinars on our website at cleanygroup.org backslash webinars and on the NWRC website as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our host for this webinar, Val Story. As I said, Val is a project director at Clean Energy Group. Val? Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. I'm going to keep my opening remarks brief so that we can move on to some terrific presentations. This webinar is being hosted by the Northeast Wind Resource Center, which is one of six resource centers funded in part by the U.S. Department of Energy's Wind Exchange Program. And the Northeast Wind Resource Center particularly is managed by the Clean Energy Group with participation from the Maine Ocean and Wind Industry Initiative and Sustainable Energy Advantage. The NWRC, as we refer to it, um, focuses on providing unbiased information on both land-based and offshore wind energy in the Northeast. Next slide. Wind Exchange, for those of you who don't know, is a U.S. DOE program platform for disseminating credible information about wind energy. And you can see there on the map the various wind resource centers across the U.S. Each of them has a website, and you can visit those sites for more information about land-based and offshore wind in the U.S. So next slide. Today we are going to be discussing opportunities for the oil and gas industry in the offshore wind sector. We're going to begin with a broad overview of those opportunities and then in our second presentation dive into a draft report and some data from Gusto MSC, a naval architect, that undertook a, a vessel study for our group and I'll talk more about that before Brian speaks, but just to give you a broad overview, we're going to be talking about oil and gas sector opportunities in the offshore wind sector. Our first presentation is going to be given by Jennifer Runyon. She is the chief editor at Renewable Energy World magazine and has been writing extensively on the opportunities for the oil and gas industry to participate in the offshore wind sector from environmental surveying to substation and foundation construction. 
In her presentation, she's going to talk a little bit about the oil and gas sector's involvement in the construction of the Block Island Wind Farm, whose foundations were built by a Louisiana and Texas-based oil and gas plant platform manufacturer. Jen will also introduce an offshore wind executive summit that she's been working hard at putting together that's going to take place in August in Texas, and Jen will talk more about that in her presentation. As a way of introduction, Jennifer Runyon is the chief editor at RenewableEnergyWorld.com and Renewable Energy World magazine. She coordinates, writes, and edits columns, features, and news stories and blogs for the publication. She also serves as the conference chair for the Offshore Wind Executive Summit and the Renewable Energy Conference Chair for PowerGen International, where she also heads up the Women in Power Committee. She's received several awards, including in 2008, she won an Eddy Award for her editing work on an article about solar trees in Vienna. She holds a master's degree in English education from Boston University and a BA in English from the University of Virginia. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much, Val. Um, that was a nice long introduction, and uh, I don't know that I wore all that, but but anyway, um, hi everybody. Again, my name is Jen Runyon. I have been covering the renewable energy industry for about 10 years. And over those 10 years, I have been watching the growth of the offshore wind industry in Europe. And that, that industry is growing really fast. Um, in 2016, $30 billion were invested in offshore wind in Europe. And that was a 41% growth over the previous year. In addition to that, $4.1 billion were invested in China. And now it's here. In the US, we just commissioned our very first offshore wind farm in November 2016, so not even well, a little more than six months ago. That's called the Block Island Wind Farm off the coast of Rhode Island. <clears throat> and so what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today are some of the opportunities for the oil and gas industry to participate in the growth of the offshore wind industry in the US. There are lots and lots of opportunities, but I'm going to go over just a few. So let's start. The first one is project management. Whoops. So this slide is going to give you a, a pretty broad overview of all the different parts that go into the, uh, an offshore wind project. We're talking about a five-year timeline, usually for these projects at least, and that's from uh, purchasing the lease to develop the project all the way through actually turning on the turbines and getting the power onto the grid. So these are very big projects. They have lots and lots of moving parts, pun intended. and um, there are lots of opportunities for the oil and gas industry part to participate because that's what they do too. Uh, oil and gas is very used to managing very large offshore exploration projects and drilling projects and understands the complexities of working offshore in large engineering master feats. So that's one, project management. The next one is in cables. <clears throat> So from the cables, the, the cables connect the wind turbines to each other, they connect the wind turbines to the substations, and they connect the substations to the, to the shore to bring the power onshore. Um, there are lots of opportunities for companies involved in making cables, protecting cables, laying cables, exporting cables uh, to get involved in the burgeoning offshore wind industry in the U.S. And so this is just an announcement that was just made in February. JDR, which is a company that does play in the offshore oil and gas industry, was just selected by U.S. Wind, which is a company that's about to start the development of an, uh, another offshore wind farm off the coast of New England. Um, so JDR is going to be working with them. Good, good opportunity to diversify. All right, our second way they can get involved, offshore oil and gas can play in the offshore wind industry is through substations. An offshore substation is basically used to collect the, the energy. So when we have a larger offshore wind farm, to minimize the loss of electricity from the turbine to the shore, we send it all to a substation and then we use one electrical line from that substation back to shore. So these offshore substations are very similar to drilling platforms. All the parts and, and a lot, many of the, the very same <clears throat> components that are used in um, drilling 
drilling rigs are used in an offshore substation. So any company that's involved in making components, helicopters, all kinds of equipment, lots of ways to get involved there. All right, the next way to get involved are through the foundations. So this is a look at some of the different types of foundations that offshore wind turbines sit on. <clears throat> the three on the left side of your screen are um, known as uh, fixed, fixed foundations. They sit all the way down on the, on the seabed floor. They're used usually in more shallow water. Um, those are primarily what's in operation today. We have some floating offshore wind, but it's really, really minor. It's just really getting started. Um, and those are the, the three turbines examples on the right side of your screen. Those are fixed to the, the seabed with mm -hmm. cables, but, um, but they are essentially floating on the water. So um, <clears throat> let's see, I have an announcement. Right, so the first, uh, Statoil and Mazdar are actually just about to commission the High Wind Project, which is the very first offshore, floating offshore wind farm, and that's going to come off the coast of Scotland, um, a, another smaller project. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Next slide is showing you a little bit more on those fixed bottom foundations. This is showing exactly where the overlap is and the different types of foundations. Gravity base, also used by oil and gas and wind, monopile, suction pile. You um, can read through all of those. Um, but essentially, there's lots of overlaps for foundations between oil and gas and offshore wind. All right, and our next crossover is in secondary steel work. So what you're looking at here is a picture of the actual foundations that were used in the Block Island wind farm. They were built by a company based in Louisiana called uh, Gulf, uh, Gulf Island Fabricators. They, that's a company that really primarily serves the oil and gas industry, but um, was able to <clears throat> build these giant structures for our Block Island wind farm in Rhode Island. If you look closely in the middle of that photo there, you can see a little person with a blue hard hat. Uh, that's how big those structures are. These are massive, massive steel structures. Um, and um, so, yeah, so lots of steel need, lots of steel work. Um, I would also note that these were designed by Keystone Engineering, and they adapted oil and gas technology to create these offshore wind um, our, uh, foundations. All right, and so my very last example is in the installation equipment, installation support service, and maintenance and inspection services, um, another very big overlap from offshore oil and gas to offshore wind. The photo that you're looking at here is, again, an example. Of, this was taken during the construction of the Block Island Wind Farm. I, I was lucky enough to get to go out there on a boat and watch this, this taking place when they were installing. This was the fourth of the five turbines that were installed. Um, the boat here on the left is from Montco, which is a Louisiana-based company that serves the offshore oil and gas industry. Um, the owner of that company had become pretty interested in offshore wind for very way back when and, and got his name out there and um, was then hired to help support the installation of the, uh, of the turbines themselves when they went up. Um, the, the giant boat in the middle had to come over from Europe because we don't have one of those in the U.S. And that's what you're about to hear a whole lot more about from Brian. Um, but what I just, before I go, I just wanted to introduce you to the Offshore Wind Executive Summit. This is the very first conference that Renewable Energy World and Offshore Magazine together are putting on. It's taking place this August. This is the first conference that's going to explore the parallels of offshore wind, oil, and gas. And I'd love for everybody to come who's interested. We are offering $50 off our early bird registration rate, which we just extended to June 9th. You have to use that promo code VESSEL. Um, and that's that. So I will leave it there, and I will hand it over to Brian and be happy to answer some questions after Brian's done with his presentation. Thanks, everyone.
Great. Thanks, Jen. This is Val. I'm just going to jump in before Brian starts. One, just a quick reminder, there is a questions dialog box as part of the webinar feature, so feel free to type in questions and we will get to them at the end of the hour during our Q&A session with both presenters. Let me introduce Brian Cheater. He's a senior consultant at Gusto MSC. He has a master's degree in naval architecture from Memorial University of Newfoundland and has over 20 years of experience in the shipping and offshore industry and now in offshore wind as well. We, um, Clean Energy Group and the Clean Energy States Alliance commissioned a study through a Northeast multi-state offshore wind group which CISA coordinates and we uh, commissioned a study with Gusto MSC to answer the question, what's it going to take to build an offshore wind vessel in the Northeast? And Gusto MSC has been researching what it would take to build a Jones Act compliant turbine installation vessel for, for this region. And as you'll hear in Brian's presentation, the study assumed a pipeline of projects and guaranteed work to support the construction of such a vessel. And he will talk about just what that business case is for constructing a heavy lift vessel. Just as a note, the report has not yet been released. The final report's not yet available. And today, Brian will be presenting pre preliminary results from the study. The final report, along with several other reports that this multi-state group has been working on, and the multi-state group consists of state energy offices from Maine, New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, will be available over the next several months. We'll be releasing them as they become available, and we'll be hosting future webinars to discuss the reports. With that, I will turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, of course, uh, my name is Brian Tudor. I'm with Gusto MSC, and we'll be talking about the NYSERDA wind farm installation vessel uh, study today. So we'll start with a little bit of company background. We'll discuss our track record. Uh, we'll move on to discuss the vessel study, the physical environment in which we are installing these turbines, uh, the assumed wind farm. We'll talk about transportation installation strategies. Finally, we'll talk about our solution to satisfy these requirements and finances. So some company background. We began as a shipyard over in the Netherlands, um, and we've gone through a number of, uh, of organizations, but we emerged in 2012 as an independent uh, entity uh, owned by Parcom uh, Capital. Uh, we have two offices. We're still, uh, we are headquartered in Skidam. We have about 140 engineers in Skidam, and we have an office in Houston uh, to service the uh, U.S. market. We provide primarily designs of mobile offshore units. We supply equipment. We perform engineering consultancy services. And we provide customer service for the equipment that we supply. Um, Gusto MSC is very keen on interacting with clients and understanding uh, the needs of the market and being able to anticipate trends so that we can update our portfolio to reflect those. We collaborate a lot with energy companies, developers, high-end contractors, universities, shipyards, and government organizations. Um, safety and efficiency are key words for us. And we're always looking at ways to improve our designs over time. This is a this is an example of the design series that we do. So for our CJ series, these are cantilever jackups that are used primarily in drilling. Uh, the AJ series are combination jackup units, again, used for the offshore market. Then we have a C and NG series for construction. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be discussing these more in a little while. Then we have our drill ships and semi-submersibles used primarily for the drilling market. Then we have our wind turbine installation version of the NG series and our tri-floaters, which are floating wind. In addition to those series, we also provide design services for heavy lift vessels such as the Oleg Strasnov. In this case, we, we designed the vessel and we also designed the 5,000 ton crane that's being used. This is a close-up of our tri-floater, which is our semi-submersible floating wind turbine foundation. And engineering consultancy, we provide a full range of upgrade modifications, uh, support for leg extensions, mooring upgrades, hull form modification, uh, stability, structural modifications, all normal naval architectural and, 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 and uh, structural work. Uh, we provide hydrodynamics and model testing, CFD studies, and on the equipment, uh, we'll supply designs and jacking systems, fixed systems 
and these are some of the uh, projects that we've worked on. Jacking equipment, uh, we supplied all the jacking equipment for our designs and these consist of the classic hydraulic uh, um, system for cylindrical legs and we have our continuous hydraulics uh, jacking system for cylindrical legs and that's what we're going to be using on the new uh, units. Then we have rack and pinion for truss legs. And as examples of some of the crane types that we would work on, uh, typically you'd have a bucket uh, style crane for heavy lift uh, crane vessels, uh, then leg, leg encircling cranes and column cranes. And these all have uh, different limitations. What we'll be focusing on today will be the leg cranes. And the leg encircling crane is designed for is designed to fit on top of the jack house on our units, and it's supported by a bogey wheel system instead of the slew bearing. This allows us to make larger diameter of slew bearing, so we can increase the load capacity on the crane. And we have cranes that's designed to go up to 1,500 or 2,500 tons. So this is all of our track record in offshore wind. Uh, we've installed yeah, of 2,614 turbines. We've installed 2,000 of them, which is 77% of the market share. Of 2,000 foundations, we've installed 64% of them, which um, we, which again is a, is a dominant market position. Uh, and the, these can be installed by uh, units similar to the Brave Turn, as you see the C installer here, which is owned by A to C, or we have another design, the Svanen, which was originally designed for doing uh, bridge installation, which has been repurposed for installing monopiles. And you can see a picture of that down at the bottom. So we have a lot of experience with this. And our reference list shows this. We have, we've been involved from 1982 with the design of the buzzard, going all the way up to the Penta Ocean in 2018. Um, it's a total of 35 units. And these units, uh, are split into two main categories. We have our C-series, which are non-propelled jack-up units, um, and then we have our NG-series, which are which are self which are self-propelled units. They fit it with a dynamic positioning or DP system, and we'll talk about the DP system in a little bit more detail later on. These have gone through a number of evolutions. We started off with shallow water units uh, that in some cases had uh, land-based crawler cranes on the deck for performing crane operations. And then this evolved over time to where we had like dedicated cranes that were integrated with the structure of the unit. But the first generations of units were 35 to 40 meter water depths and crane capacities going up to 800 tons. And variable deck loads capacities of about 2,200 tons maximum. Then this progressed with the industry, and then we're getting into self-propelled and, and dynamic position units. And crane capacities increased up to 800 to 1,000 tons, and we're seeing load capacities increase uh, for, for deck load from 2,500 to 6,500 tons, and water depths are going up somewhere between 45 and 55 meters. Um, and the Fred Olson unit is, is an example of this range. And now, what we're now for the latest iteration, we're seeing our deep water range, and we're seeing water depths that are extending up to 65 meters with cranes that are pushing 1,200 to 2,500 tons. And again, these are all self-propelled on DP. And one of the vessels that you see on the screen is the Sea Jack uh, uh, Skilla, which is the largest uh, wind, which is the largest uh, yeah, lift boat in the world. So, on the vessel study. We were pulled. To, we were we were, uh, we were uh, introduced to this by NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and NYSERDA is part of a DOE-funded project with New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine. Uh, there's a growing realization that commercial wind farm development will need cross-state cooperation, and as part of that, there's a roadmap for multi-state cooperation offshore wind development, which which Val introduced, and we are working on the U.S. Vessel Study, which is part of a strategy to achieve a regional market of scale. So our goal here is to create a framework to understand what is required of a wind turbine installation vessel from technical and financial perspectives. Essentially, we need to design a wind turbine installation vessel, cost it, and then define the business case required to support it. But the inevitable question will be, well, what do we design? In order to answer that question, there are other questions that, I, that, that had to be brought up to define the physical context. So what do we need to install and where does it need to go? We didn't know what the what the wind turbine size will be, what do the waters look like, how, you know, in other words, how big is it, and how do we need to lift it, and how do we hold it for installation? What do the water depth and mid-ocean conditions look like at the sites we need to work? 
and how far do we need to travel and what are the limitations on draft beam and height, for example, due to port restrictions, et cetera. Also from a financial context, we need to know the capex of Jones Act vessel. How much will it actually cost? What would be the operating expenses? How many turbine installations might be required and how many years of work does this correspond to? And what kind of pipeline is required? And what combination of day rates and pipeline generate acceptable returns on investment? So the methodology that we chose, that we adopted to answer these questions was, first of all, to assume a hypothetical but realistic set of wind farm developments in the region. Then assume construction and installation methodologies, develop functional requirements to satisfy those methodologies, develop the concept designs for a wind turbine installation vessel or feeder jack up satisfying the technical requirements. Then we submitted the SMAs SMA packages to selected US yards to obtain build prices for Jones Act compliant vessels. And the yards we, that, that we uh, used initially were, um, were Edison Schwest, World Marine, and Conrad. Uh, but there are other yards um, you know, that, that would be very, very suitable. Um, then we created a crewing model for a US flagged installation vessel. And we created vessel specific financial model tracking capex and operational expenses generate uh, financial metrics such as net present value and internal rate of return. So the physical environment, where are we? Obviously on the East Coast, it covers a wide range. We are going to focus in on Massachusetts, uh, New York, Rhode Island for a couple of reasons. Uh, primarily because from a design perspective, this will be the deepest water in the harshest environment. So this is what will govern the design of our units. So this will be the main focus area. But as we can see that there are several wind, farm in, wind farms in other areas, and particularly when we look down off the coast of Maryland, we have U.S. wind, which was just recently announced. And these are going to be in shallower water, uh, but those, those, are, you know, those are outside the, current, the uh, current study, which is focusing more on the design cases. So looking at the worst case scenarios, we're looking at, we looked at the distribution of water depths. So we looked at the wind areas that were identified uh, for those areas, and we essentially we just tallied the water depths by by blocks. And what we what we found is that 81% of the sites are in waters that are less than 55 meters of water, and the average water depth in the region is 48.71 meters. So we chose as our design as our design water depth 55 meters. And let's put this in perspective. This is deep compared to Europe. When we look at the projects that we've seen to, to date in Europe, most of them have been in shallower waters, ranging from like 10 to 40 meters. We are now starting to see deeper projects in Europe as well, uh, but historically they, they've all been shallower. And this has implications because monopiles which have worked very well in Europe might not translate as well to the American market where the waters are deeper. But this is an area of active research, and so in the future, who knows? One of the other things we had to look at were the site conditions. So some of the information we want to know are in terms of environmental conditions are wave conditions. What is the wave height, the wave period? What are the tides and storm surges, wind speeds and currents? And these are all important to us from a design perspective because these will all create environmental loads like, for example, wind drag, or wave overturning moments, um, et cetera. So we need to have a good idea on what the environmental conditions will be. Uh, based on an analysis of, of uh, NOAA uh, well weather buoy data, uh, we found that for 50, we found a set of 50-year conditions that we rounded up uh, to this set of design conditions. So we took as our design uh, significant wave height at 10 meters, maximum wave height of 19.5 meters at 14 seconds, the uh, highest astronomical tide of 0 0.79 meters, associated storm surge of 1.59 meters, which is a which is a respectable storm surge. Uh, then one meter, I'm sorry, one minute mean wind at 10 meters is about 74 knots, and surface current is about 2.3 knots. Another major consideration for us as a jack-up unit that is going to be supported on the seabed are the uh, geotechnical conditions or soil conditions. Unfortunately, we have no site-specific data available. Usually, there would be like a site-specific uh, geotechnical study done, but Based on public reports, um, we've 
been able to identify a high sand content in 80 to 100 percent of the northern two-thirds of the region. And if that is the case, then we expect a hard bottom with very limited penetration. So spud can fixity will be limited, and that will have an impact on the design. Uh, and it's down in the south, it's predominantly silt and clay, uh, so we expect a little bit more penetration and more fixity, uh, which would actually help us. Um, then we also have that there's a lot, this is this entire area is at the southern extent of glaciation, so there's a risk of large boulders, and that will have, an, that will have implications for pile driving. So what we see compared to Europe is that we have increasing water depths, uh, 15 to 30 meters in Europe uh, with recent projects going up to 45 or 50, and northeastern United States, a range of 15 to 65 meters. And of course, the design conditions are, are a little bit are, uh, significant. We have like 59 foot winter waves. So moving on, this is the environment. So now the question is, what are we going to install in there? What we assumed was we're working with projects of 100, uh, you know, that, that, that are groups of 100 8 megawatt to wind turbines. Uh, foundations, piles and jackets, optional. Then we would look at the towers and the cells and the blades. We want to allow for safe and secure year-round operation. We want maximum water depth of 55 meters summer, 50 meters winter. Uh, deck and load capacity to carry four turbines. Crane capacity to reach, lift and position and hold in precise alignment all the components for an 8 megawatt turbine. So what does an 8 megawatt turbine look like? Of course, uh, over the years, there's been a steady increase in the size of these turbines, and uh, these are going to increase further beyond the 8 megawatt turbines. Um, we also wanted to allow a little bit of margin in our designs. So the parameters that you see on the screen represent what we think is a reasonable upper bound for the range of designs for an 8 megawatt turbine might come out to be, along with a little bit of extra margin. So perhaps with upgrades, we could handle a 10 megawatt turbine. So, for example, uh, we would expect the turbine, the uh, rotor diameter to be 160 meters, perhaps, for an 8 megawatt. We assume the 175. The nacelle weights might be 390 tons. We assume 450. Uh, and this is so that the design values we're using and sizing the equipment uh, have, have some margins in there so that we can accommodate uh, future growth. Uh, so looking at components specifically, towers may be up to 500 metric tons, lengths of 94 meters, diameters of 6.75 meters. And as you can see from the picture, these would typically be stood upright and they represent a concentrated load on the, uh, on the uh, deck of the, uh, of the insulation vessel. And if you have six, if you have six of these, uh, that could be 3,000 tons sitting in the middle of the, of the vessel. So, um, the boat has to be specially designed to carry these. The nacelles have to be lifted uh, to great height and we need to be able to have the reach to be able to install them. Nacelles themselves may be 21 meters long by about 10 meters wide by 10 meters high. They may weigh up to 450 tons with a 50 metric ton lifting frame and they need to be lifted to at least 117 meters above the sea and held in place while they are bolted. If we looked at the, if we take a look at what the install might look like, we can see that uh, we have 500 ton safe working load and total height uh, to the top, you know, to, and a total height up to the uh, top of the uh, hook is about 123 meters. Now, unfortunately, to lift 500 tons to that height is not going to require, is not going to uh, be possible with a 500 ton crane. We need to look at and the reason for that is we need to look at the crane capacity curves. And when we look at the crane capacity curve, a typical one is shown on the screen where we can see sort of like a, an arc at the top showing the uh, main hoist uh, trajectory. Uh, and then down below that, if we drop down, we see a, we see a load curve. And the load curves are supplied for, for the different hooks, but the one in red uh, that's sloping and that the slopes up for concave um, shows what the main hoist uh, load curve is, uh, is like. So what we need to do is we need to go and we need to be able to prove that we can reach 123 meters at the appropriate outreach and with the appropriate lifting capacity. And so a 500 ton crane would not really be, would not normally be sufficient so we have to increase that. So what we end up with in this situation in order to lift that weight to that height we need to have an 800 ton crane minimum. So that's why in a lot of cases these cranes look and are relatively big compared to the weights that we're actually lifting. 
Also, when we look at the turbine blades, uh, these need to be lifted to great height and great reach. And the blades are 85 meters long with a 6 meter cord. And they weigh up to 40 metric tons apiece. And they lifted, need to be lifted to at least 117 meters. And they need to be held in place while they are bolted. Typically, there's a frame that attaches to the, turret, to the blade, as we can see. And when they, when they go up, they need to be held precisely for an extended period of time for assembly and security. Uh, for securing. As you can see on the end of the blade, there are, uh, there are a large number of bolts and these fit into holes on the rotor and there are guys inside the rotor who are, to who are torquing these down. Um, while the torquing operation is, is being conducted, it's very important that nothing shift. Um, unfortunately, we have a relatively large weight on the top of, of a slender tower uh, with the turbine and we have a, a large weight at, at, on the top of uh, their legs for the jack up and both of these items will tend to sway. So what we want to do is on the jack up unit we design it so that the natural periods of surge and sway are, are outside the range of excitation so we can minimize the amount of movement on, on, on our unit and then minimize the uh, movement of the crane tip. Um, and that's all so that we can provide a steady um, support as possible. And you know, this, is the, this is to ensure safety to personnel. So some of the design considerations that come into play for, for, for monopiles, like once we fix our, you know, let's assume we have an eight megawatt turbine, then we have to look at water depth. And the first question is, the water depth, is the water depth greater than 20 meters for this turbine size? And, you know, and uh, this is just a sample. Every project will have to do its own sort of like specific analysis. Uh, but, you know, for water depths greater than 20 meters, a monopile's uh, established, uh, you know, no. Um, and then what we had to do is we, we had to look at then if the water depth is greater than 20 meters, then we had to look at jackets. And then if we're looking at jackets, there are different types of jackets, but, you know, if we do pin piles, pin, uh, if we don't do pin piles, then we have to do site prep, then, which is rock dumping, jetting, and leveling. Uh, and, but if we do do, but if we use pin piles, then we can use, that we, can, uh, we don't need to do any, uh, we don't need to do as much site prep. Then next question comes, well, what's the jack weight? If the jack weight is greater than 1,100 tons, we can't lift it with a 1,500-ton crane, which basically means we have to use a floating crane vessel. Uh, but if we can, if the jacket is less than 1,100 tons, we can install it with the wind turbine insulation vessel. Um, and if so, then we need a 1,500-ton uh, crane to install the uh, jacket. Um, and if we're just looking at the nacelle by itself, it's an 800-ton crane. So this is a this is a sample of some of the decision trees that people can go through when they look at uh, trying to identify the equipment that's required. And every project will have its own set of specific conditions, so we'll lead it to its own set of decisions. Uh, for ourselves, we ended up with a with pin pile jackets and a 1500 ton crane. Um, part of the reason why we didn't look at monopiles as well is that uh, mono, is that this combination of um, a turbine and water depth exceeds the proven range for monopiles. Uh, in addition to that, with boulders, uh, there's a risk of monopile refusal if the boulder was hit. Um, but of course, in more southern regions like uh, like Maryland with U.S. wind, it's you know you wouldn't have boulder issues in the water shallower. So perhaps the so so they they might very well come to a different set of conclusions. Um, jackets may be more complex to manufacture, but are proven technology. And pin pile jackets were adopted as the most weight efficient, and also with the ins and also with these, the insulation of the piles can be done separately, providing more schedule flexibility. So, some of the requirements that come from an eight megawatt turbine with foundation with uh, pin pile uh, foundations: we watered up to fifty-five meters. We have an air gap of fifteen. Jacket type of seventy. Uh, jacket base is 30 meters by 30 meters. Jacket weight's about 1,000 tons, just a little bit less than 1,000 tons, but we rounded it up. Uh, then if we're going to transport it, we could transport it on the back of a cargo barge, three or four per trip, or on the deck of a self-propelled WTIV or feeder barge, one per trip. And the piles, the piles would have to be about 2.7 meters in diameter, 40 meters long, about 150 metric tons each. And we would do the pile installation and driving by hammer. So what all this does is it gives us a baseline for the size and the weight of the items that we're going to have to deal with using the installation vessel. So now we can move on to talk about transportation installation. Now that we've looked at the size and weight of the components and how we 
how we might have to deal with the, the installation at a very high level, we can look at some of the uh, options. Uh, there are two main transportation strategies. We have a transit strategy where we have a field that where we have a main wind turbine installation vessel that sails into port loads and then carries parts and material out to the wind farm site where it will perform the installation. It will then return to port for the next load. We also have a feeder strategy in which there's a field bound WTIV and is supplied by one or more feeder barges which ferry parts and material out from the port to the wind farm site. The WTIV lifts the material off the feeder barge which then returns to the port for more material. The feeder barges are smaller units with no main crane. The feeder strategy offers some advantages in that usually you can usually the wind turbine insulation vessel is is always in the field, so it's, so it's a little bit more efficient if it's uh, fed if it's being continuously fed. Um, but of course, then you have to balance that gain in efficiency against the increase in capex from having the WTIV plus the two feeder barges. And again, this is something that a developer would have to look at on a project-specific basis. They, they would have to decide what makes sense. So some of the requirements for transportation, this is, for example, uh, you know, we need to have large deck capacity for transit options. This is, a little, this is one potential layout that's common in Europe where we might transport four turbines. Um, and Typically, it's about 3,450 square meters of deck space, 6,400 tons of deck load. Uh, and this layout would work in Europe. It would also work for a uh, field-bound uh, WTIV that's just loaded up from a feeder barge. Uh, but it would not necessarily be suitable for entry into, into ports that are narrow or have restrictions. In those cases, what we had to do is we had to reorient the, the blades so that they were cantilevered out over the stern. So some of the design considerations that come into a transportation study would be, for example, what strategy you're adopting. Uh, are we adopting a feeder option or not? If we're not adopting a feeder option, then we need to have a self-propelled transit vessel with DP2. Uh, and you know, if it, then are we going to limit ourselves to existing ports? Yes or no. If yes, then we have maximum beam. If not, then we have uh, then we are free to adjust the deck area and variable load capacity to suit whatever the requirements are. If we're not going with feeder option, it, you know, sorry, if we are going with feeder option, uh, then we're going to have feeder barges. Then are we going to try and moor up the, uh, the barges? Uh, but if we do use mooring systems, then we have to start fitting all the units with mooring winches. We have to fit them with anchors and anchor racks. We have to provide DP tugs to maneuver. And we have to provide anchor handling tugs then to, you know, to, to be able to uh, hold everything in station and move it into place. Um, and this becomes very complex, uh, so we believe that the best option would be to automatically fit a DP system. Uh, if we fit a DP system, then the question is, do we install the DP system uh, pre-installed in the yard, or do we supply it as an add-on module? Uh, for a unit that's going to have a lifespan of 10 to 20 years, uh, it's a, we, we believe it's better to do the DP installation in the shipyard. So some of the challenges that we'll find with marine operations are that we need to transit and accurately position and, and the installation vessel at least one to 300 times in quick succession. So a dynamic positioning system should be installed. Uh, but of course, as we just discussed, there are issues with that and there's lack of ready inventory, deep and capable tugs, and as well, handling all those different vessels in close proximity for an extended period of time increases the SIMOPS risk or the risk that something could, something could go wrong from having simultaneous operations in close proximity to each other. Uh, the ports uh, limit the maximum beam to 150 feet and draft must be less than 28.5 feet and vessels will not be able to enter ports with bridges um, and these are some of the uh, major issues that we would face on the marine operations. Another one that I'll add to this is with the uh, jacking up and jacking down operations. There's normally a preload um, operation that must be completed. Um, and on a four-legged jack-up, we all of our units are four-legged, and they're, and they're all four-legged because we can do diagonal preloading, which means we do not have to do any water ballasting operations to do our preloading. Um, and this allows us to save a lot of time. So assuming that, you know, so now that we have our transportation options sorted out, the next question comes installation. What are we going to assume in terms of an installation strategy? So if we're using pin pile jackets, we can, set, we can 
configure the unit to do all the pin pile installations up front. So we would have a uh, we, we would have a template. We lower down to the seabed. Then we lower our piles to the template, pile drive, uh, lift the template out of the way, then do an as-built survey of the, um, of the piles. And this operation could be done in the off-season uh, because it's not as weather sensitive. Uh, then the jacket installation is, is, is more weather sensitive but not quite as weather sensitive and this could be done early or late in the season. And for jacket installation, we would lift the uh, jackets, we would uh, accurately lower it down onto the pin piles, grout it in place, and then do an as-built survey to verify levelness and, uh, and grouting. Then next stage would be to do turbine installation in summer. And this could be done, you know, in, you know, the, we, we do the tower installation, then we install the nacelle, then we install each one of the tree blades. And one of the advantages of breaking it up like this in the pin pile, jacket, and turbine installation is that we can do these at several times a year where we take advantage of the, uh, of the uh, where, where we take advantage of the conditions. So all the weather sensitive operations can be focused in the summertime uh, and all the least weather sensitive operations can be focused in on the winter time. But of course, uh, with this unit, we can operate year round. So we could do turbine installations in winter, for example. It's just that we'd have more downtime waiting for the weather conditions to improve. In addition to that, we also had to factor in that we would have, that we could have uh, time of year restrictions due to, for example, uh, marine mammals, or and we would have to look at noise abatement. And all of these issues would have to be sorted as well from a, from a permitting perspective. So our solution to perform this uh, it's, it you know, takes into account the design philosophy that when does, you know, like a lot of these operations are a lot like offshore oil and gas, but the, but wind is not like offshore oil and gas in that this is a repetitive industrial process, not a one-off operation. Uh, most most oil and gas operations tend to be custom one-off operations. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of engineering and effort goes into you know, goes into the operation beforehand. A lot of planning. Uh, we need to be more like an assembly line where we have our techniques and our tools in place so that it's just like stamping out a machine part. Um, we want to reduce the risk of scheduled delay through to improved operability and simplicity of operation. We don't want to be doing any excess operations offshore, like welding of piles and stuff like this. We, you know, if we had to bring out a welding torch, that's, you know, that's that's just introducing an extra operation and more risk into it. Uh, we should be looking for like one piece, uh, you know, one piece operations. Um, we want to reduce personnel exposure in small boats over the side or at height. We want to maintain positive control of all loads at all tides. We want to provide flexibility to perform more than one function. We want to increase our operational weather window. And this is an important one because we want to be able to loiter out in the field, even during winter storms, and then, and then be there out there ready and waiting so that when a winter window does open up, we can take advantage of it immediately. We don't want to be in port waiting for a weather window so that we can sail out. Um, so that's why we want to stay on location and operate year round and ease loading op options important. And we have to satisfy all class and U.S. Coast Guard requirements. Uh, so we designed to the 50-year winter storm per SNAMI 5-5A and provide a 1,500-ton crane with a minimum 30-meter lift radius, uh, self-propelled to be greater than or equal to 9 knots and self-installing with a DP2 system. We want to minimize preload time using cross-loading on four legs. Um, and we talked about that earlier. Uh, continuous jacking system, uh, 24 meters per hour to speed up going on location. And I think the last two points are important because we have to, th we have to realize that uh, a unit like this will be going in place. It'll be, it'll be transiting from one site to the other. It'll be jacking up. It'll be doing an operation for a day or two, jack down, move to another site, jack up, do the operation, jack down, move to another site. So that's fundamentally different from offshore oil and gas where a drilling jackup will go in place and it might spend two or three months on one site. And for a unit like that, spending 12 to 24 hours doing a preload operation is, is not an onerous burden. If we if we are in a situation where we're having to move every every two days, then spending 12 to 24 hours doing a preload operation becomes a burden. Uh, so our, our main wind turbine installation vessel was the NG9800CUS, and this is a modification of the Brave turn that was used on Block Island. 
basically, we lengthened the hull out to 127.8 meters. We reduced the width down to 42 meters. The hull depth is about 10 meters. Overall lake length, including the spud can, is 92 meters. And the lake length under the hull is 69 meters, which gives us a water depth in survival conditions of 50 to 55 meters. Uh, 55 for summer, 50, I'm sorry, 55 for summer, 50 for winter. Uh, it gives us a total variable load of 6,400 tons over a deck area of 3,450 square meters. Uh, it's a DP2 system. Uh, we've never, we have not seen the requirement for DP3. Uh, DP tree systems. Um, sorry, let me let me just explain the difference. Uh, DP is a dynamic positioning, and basically it's a system that allows you to automatically control the location of the unit based on position reference uh, systems. And so, you can set a location on the seabed that you want, to, or to, that they want to maintain position next to, um, or you can tell it, or you can give it a track to follow, uh, and the system will do so automatically. Uh, the DP1, 2, and 3 refers to the amount of redundancy that's built into the system. So a DP2 system can still hold position if you lose any, any single active or passive component. Uh, and that's typically the requirement that we're seeing for, winter, for, for wind farm installation. People in the oil and gas industry might see a DP3 requirement, which is basically a step over and above this, where you maintain station even if you have a fire or flooding in any one compartment. Uh, typically, that would be required for diver operations or where you're doing close, close proximity operations next to a platform that is actively, that's actively producing. Uh, the risk factors are different here, so we see DP2 as being, as, as being the requirement. We don't see DP3 at this point. Um, then in jacking moves, we're looking at about 150 moves per year, uh, and of course the main crane about uh, 1,500 tons, and this is a rendering of the unit. Then the feeder unit is a much smaller unit. It has a hull length of about 70.5 meters, hull width of about 38 meters, and hull depth of 6.5 meters, and a speed of seven knots. So the leg length is about 86 meters, and the leg length under the hull is about 68 meters. Uh, water depth is about 50 meters. Um, the variable deck load is 3,400 tons, uh, spread over 1,800 square meters. Uh, POB is only 12. It's a small unit. It only needs enough crew to operate. Uh, and it's designed for about 150 jacking moves per year. So the finances, the average price that came in for 9800C US, the wind turbine installation vessel, was about $222 million. Um, to make this work uh, financially, we need about 10 years of work at $220,000 a day to generate an internal rate of return of at least 10%. Uh, down below, we can see an indicative construction schedule, uh, about 34 months from start to finish. And the average price for the 3750C feeder unit was about $87 million. And this requires 20 years of work at $85,000 a day to generate an internal rate of return of at least 10%. And construction schedule indicative uh, is shown below, about 25 months. Um, and conclusions. The wind turbine installation vessel requires about 10 years of work, uh, feeder barge 20. This will require not one project, but an identified pipeline of projects that a group of states, developers, and federal agencies cooperate on. However, if the full potential of the offshore wind areas on the East Coast is realized, and not just a sample considered here, because there are other areas, then not one, but several vessels may be justified. Um, that's, that, I think, is it. Uh, thank you for very much for, for your attention. Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you to Jen as well. Very thorough presentation. Let's turn to some questions. And for those of you who are still with us, I know we're nearing the close of the hour. Please feel free to type in your questions in the questions dialog box. I want to start with you, Brian, and can you talk a little bit more about how far a vessel, can, a wind turbine installation vessel, can travel? So, if you're assuming a pipeline of projects, what's the geographic scope, or were you just, you know, this is um, you're thinking about the Northeast as a region? Um, does that include we, we, travel from Maine to Rhode Island? No, we were when we when we did this, we, we assumed a range of distances, and we were looking at distances between 120 to 160 nautical miles, and that was more or less based on sort of like let's say going from a port in Massachusetts to the uh, tip of Long Island, for example. 
and that's sort of like the range, you know, the the, uh, the range of distances that that we were considering. We were we were anticipating that there would be a local port, not necessarily a regional port or, or one port for the East Coast. We assumed that there would be local port to the you know to the uh, to the section we're talking about. Great, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the the business case for a wind turbine installation vessel and possibly, yeah, I think it would just be the wind turbine installation vessel. Do you assume winter operation and how does the business case change with the, you know, if there are marine mammals present or if there are harsh winter storm conditions? We are, yeah, in, in the current in, in the current scenario, we're looking at how we can maximize the use of the wind turbine installation vessels. So the installation strategy has uh, different operations that can be completed at different times of the year. So we look at so we look at the gearing up to do all of the pin pile installations uh, during the during the winter months, uh, and then in early spring and late fall doing the installations for the uh, jackets and then in summer and early fall doing the installation for the turbines. So we're looking at year-round operation of the vessel. Um, and, and certainly if there are reasons why we can't use it in winter, uh, then we'd have to try and follow and find alternative uses for for the wind for, 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 for the vessel. Uh, but our base case is that we can use it all year round. And if there are restrictions on like marine mammals, for example, then what we could do is we could shift things around a little bit and we could do some of the pile driving at other times of the year and accept the, and, but then there would be sort of like a lower operability uh, uptime associated with doing wind turbine installation or doing jacket installations, for example. Great, thank you. Did the study look at all at the, the trade-off and costs between building a Jones Act compliant vessel from the ground up or retrofitting an oil and gas vessel or using European vessels on a feeder barge? No, we, we, did, we didn't look at that. Uh, this vessel was concentrated, sorry, the study was concentrated solely on doing a new build. Uh, there are a lot of options, there are a lot of studies and proposal have been put forth uh, for, for using like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, normal drilling jackups, converting them into wind turbine installation vessels. Uh, we, we looked at that as well because we have a lot of uh, designs for triangular jackup units that we would love to, to, to adapt. And part of the problem we ran into there was with the preload. And it's just the amount of time that we're required to actually do the preload just becomes prohibitive. So we so we backed off of trying to convert jacket, you know, drilling jackups uh, into wind turbine installation vessels. In addition to that, the jacking systems are designed on these uh, units for multiple use. We're designed for up to 150 jacking operations per year. Uh, we try to keep the weight down on the top. We try to keep the weight down on the hull. Um, you know, uh, even more so than than on a drilling jackup. So, these are, I, I to, to to use a crude analogy, these are more like racehorses. So we uh, we didn't look at trying to convert one. And in terms of the existing units, that uh, we have done work on on existing. Uh, 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 wind turbine installation vessels, for example, leg extensions and uh, and uh, crane boom extensions, and companies have done that, and that's allowed them to uh, be able to install larger turbines than were originally planned. Thank you, Brian. Another question for you: Could you review the the size of the pipeline needed to justify construction of the first a uh, single? Uh, U.S. wind turbine installation vessel. I, I'm sorry. Could could you repeat the question? My apologies. Yeah, no problem. Could you repeat what the size of the pipeline, what size of pipeline is needed to justify construction of the very first U.S. heavy lift yes, vessel? Yes, of course. We we're looking at we're, we're looking at a requirement for about 10 years of work based on the. Based on the work that we did, we did up like a relatively detailed um, uh, uh, installation procedures with times that are associated with it, and we figured that on average we can install maybe about uh, you know a 40 to 50 uh, turbine sets per year. Uh, we figured this is about 500 turbines, so uh, so so a collection of 500 turbines would provide 10 years of, uh, of work. 
based on based on the work that we did. Great, thank you. And would the the designs that you had drawn up would that accommodate for the next generation size of wind turbines? I know you went up to eight megawatts, but would this um, drawing would the drawings drastically change for let's say a ten megawatt turbine? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. I don't know what a 10 megawatt turbine looks like exactly at this point. <laughs> and I really wish that I knew where this technology was going because, of course, for somebody who's trying to design the installation equipment, we're, we're in a difficult position. We do have some margin in there uh, for being able to accommodate larger turbines. Um, I, I can't say explicitly whether we, can, whether we could accommodate a 10 megawatt turbine because I really don't know what it looks like at this point. Uh, we do have some margin in there, so we stand a reasonable chance of being able to upgrade, but um, I, I can't say. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. All right. We have come to the close of the hour. Apologies for not being able to get through everyone's questions. A lot came in at the end there. Um, some of you have asked when the final version will be released, and I don't have a definitive date for you. The draft will need to go through internal review before we release it, but you, if you sign up for this webinar, you've been placed on our e-newsletter emailing list, and you will receive notification that the final report is out. And of course, feel free to touch base with me at val at cleanegroup.org and I could try to answer any more of your questions. A big thank you to all of you who stayed with us and who listened to the presentation and many thanks to both Jen and Brian for your presentations.